Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. Sitting across from me is, uh, let's say, Nicholas Cage enthusiast Michael Kester. Why? Okay. That's a fine title. Yeah, right? it's like whatever. Whatever. Uh, and we have two movies today. I think we have an early contender for year's best double feature. Potentially. Yeah, what do we got today? Today we're going to do Lord of War and Thank You for Smoking. So we had an idea with this. Mm hmm. But uh, even beyond the idea, I think I think mood, treatment, uh, just the subject matter and viewpoints that the films kind of approach the subject matter with, all are kind of in line. I guess it's a devil's advocate thing. It's, yeah. it's some guy who's a hot shot. He's great at getting people to, in one film, buy and, and, and fire weapons, and in another film, buy and use cigarettes. I love that you say buy and fire weapons because he really stresses that if people aren't aren't actually firing the weapons, that's not very good for him either. Uh, yeah, you know what? There's also an underlying activist message to both of yeah. these movies, which is kind of it's really direct in um, Lord of War, but it's at the end. It's sort of tacked onto the movie, and then there's an indirect one that's sort of going through the the whole time. And thank you for smoking. So uh, maybe we'll touch on that stuff a little bit, but I'm really more interested in how the films talked about these things and yeah. didn't manage to just seem like they were... Th because when you look at both of these movies, one seems to be a gun rights movie mm -hmm. that is going to hit you really heavily with this stuff. And if anything, it does the opposite at the end of the film. And one seems like a, uh, a devil's advocate position for smoking. And it's not really that either. And uh, I don't think it's really trying to hit you over the head with anything. Uh, maybe with some philosophical arguments, but the both of the message, the message of both the films, I think, is more philosophical than anything else. Um, we are going to spoil the movies. Maybe I already spoiled the movies. I hope not. Fingers crossed. I don't think there's a high spoiler content, but you know, spoilers. Are there spoilers. may be character deaths at some point, and I think that's people consider that spoiler territory. Oh, okay. Well. Uh, and there's there's some plot stuff, not not very high spoiler wise, especially with the stuff we're going to talk about. But you've been warned. You can use the chapters to skip around. We're going to do Lord of War first. So you can skip over that to thank you for smoking. Or you could skip to the end and figure out what we are doing next time on this glorious, glorious show of ours. So uh, let's start with Lord of War. Great. Um, I know you want to talk about Nicolas Cage. So let's do that right now. All right. So Nicolas Cage was an actor that got started <laughs> in the That's 80s. That's good. Already using the past tense. Um, he got started in the 80s. He did a bunch of 80s films. He was in, some, what was it? Something with Cher. I don't care. Okay. And then he was in Wild at Heart, and he kind of... I like how you're trying to use the David Lynch to appeal well, to me. I'm this is very well, good. no, I'm trying to use his 80s stuff before right, he became right. mainstream, because then he started doing, you know, The Rock, yes. Face Off. Yeah, we covered The Rock. We talk, yeah. We've talked about Face Off a little bit. And then he started doing this slew of, of what I would call his actual career. Right. Which is when he did Lord of War, he did The Weatherman, mm -hmm. he did a few other things here and there, and then something happened, <laughs> and now he's in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. I think Ghost Rider is what Ghost happened, Rider. right? Is that what happened? I guess. See, I have this feeling, and I don't want to go down this road too far, because I just, I really don't care, but after seeing Ghost Rider, I came to the decision that Nicolas Cage had conned me into seeing his films that for some reason I've seen almost every single one of them and I always see them in theaters when they especially these days that's a rarity for me I don't fucking go out to the theater for anything Sylvester Stallone didn't direct and I would always go out to see these I saw fucking Bangkok Dangerous you know what I mean I've seen all of them Bangkok, you saw Dang Bangkok Dangerous. I did see you were looking at me as if you didn't know what that was. No, I Do know you what not it remember? is. It's okay. the first of the Nicolas Cage's broke films. Yeah, so I mean, I've seen all of these, and even after the realization of Ghost Rider that I've been conned, and I don't actually like Nicolas Cage, but for some reason I think I do. So I go, you know what I mean? Like these movies come out, and I say to myself, "Oh, Nicolas Cage, that'll be good." And it's only after the movie that I realize that I can't just see a movie for Nicolas Cage. That's not enough for me. Yet I still go out every time to see these. So I feel as if he's tricking me, and I hold a grudge for that that uh, gives me this sort of... The, uh, my opinion is biased. I can't be trusted on my opinion of Nicolas Cage because I, I feel like he's winning these bets. that See, I don't actually know Nicolas Cage, the person, 
But in my head, I go, oh, Nicolas Cage won that bet. I give him my $8. And I just feel like he's constantly taking my money from me. And uh, I hold a grudge. So fortunately, Lord of War was from his decent film career. Because recently, what? He was in Kick-Ass. He was in Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans. I am not going to say anything about that movie And Bangkok Dangerous and Mm -hmm. something else. I don't know. He shows up all the time. But you haven't hit on Wicker Man. The bees, Michael. The bees. He was in a bunch of movies. He apparently, allegedly, is broke. Apparently, and needs to allegedly, make a is bunch broke. of money back. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't care. We're talking about Lord of War back when he was still acting for money. So let's get into Lord of War right at the beginning of this uh, this film. You and I often actually the only time I can ever remember having a heated argument with you. Do you remember what it was about? No. Only time I don't think we've ever had even disagreements. But man, we had an all out fucking dispute. Over a character breaking the fourth wall. Oh, yeah. What movie was that? That was uh, M. Yeah, you called me on a bad day or something, and we were like, it was a bad time. Mm-hmm. But breaking the fourth wall has once again shown up on our show. Yeah. I'm a little curious about, all right, so Nicolas Cage is breaking the fourth wall at the very beginning of the movie. But he's also the narrator. Mm-hmm. So are you really breaking the fourth wall if there just happens to be a visual component to the scene you're narrating? In which you are speaking the narration you know what i mean i don't know i would probably say because if the if the film was done in third person uh, i guess it sort of is but you know what i mean if the film is done without the narration then without the voiceover then there's there's no uh there's no question that he's breaking the fourth wall he's Mm -hmm. talking directly to the audience although throughout the entire movie he's talking directly to the audience we just don't see him doing it it kind of makes it seem like the entire film is is he's telling it to you while standing in a street <laughs> right. laden with bullet shells. Right, right. So potentially, I guess it, you could say he's breaking the fourth wall in that he's telling you the story. But yeah. I wouldn't. I, yeah, you know, yes. I'm going to say yes, because just because when we did Edward Scissorhands, they had another storytelling bookends thing yep. without breaking the fourth wall. And that was narrated. And so I guess there's a way to do it without breaking the fourth wall. Thusly, this is a version that breaks the fourth wall. Yeah, but there really isn't that narration throughout the entire thing, is there? I mean, in Edward Scissorhands, she doesn't come back in halfway through the story and say, and then this happened, does she? She does, remember? She's like, and for the first time, it snowed or something like that. Well, I think that's when the end's coming up, Well, no, she did it like when she's dancing and stuff, too. All right, we're the only two people that care about the fourth wall anyway, so (laughs) moving right along. So it appears to be a movie that's about guns, but I think the movie is about business even more so than guns, especially in the beginning. You know, you're talking about some really universal business concepts, you know, different markets, foreign markets, competitive markets. The free market will come up in both of these films mm-hmm. quite a bit. And then, you know, the guns, I think the if you were to look at this, this is how I view this film. I view this as a film about business that uses guns to make people besides myself want to watch the film. You know what I mean? I think about Atlas Shrugged being a a thing that's kind of about business, but it uses railroads so people become even less interested than they already were. (laughs) Whereas Lord of War, oh, but there's guns. Things will explode. Come over here and sit down and watch this film. Do you think business is a really big component of this, or is that oh, just something that I'm taking well, away from no, it? Well, I no, think, I think that it's it's in there. I think a lot of it is... Um, I didn't know if I was living in a little bubble where I'm just looking for the business concepts of the film. No, I mean, it, it's that's what it's about. It's about, you know, earning the dollar at whatever cost. Right. And it, it shows, you know, the taking sides aspect of business. Who mm-hmm. are you dealing to? Who are you dealing with? And, and yeah, I mean, business is in there. It's more about... I think it's more about personal rising as an individual in right. business than it is, you know, having a company. Well, I mean, it has to be personal when you have that narration. Right. I mean, I think that was one of the easiest ways just to look at this as a standpoint of if you sat down and, you know, I don't know what the intention was originally when creating this, but if you sat down and said, I wanted to write something about business, uh, but I want to make it personal, you have someone tell a story about business and about what they learned and how all of these concepts came to them. And that makes it not just a, you know, you're, you're not sitting in a classroom. It's not a business, le- uh, business lecture, really, that someone is giving you because they have this personal story and they have uh, something to tell you about their family and how that you know, became involved with business, about their trips to these crazy places, about not getting AIDS. Right. But the other side of that, I mean, it's not just from the, the writing standpoint that they kind of detract from that, but it also has this... I would almost call it a pop sensibility. Does that make sense? Yeah. It has a lot of 80s. It just feels much lighter than it actually is, mm-hmm. than the subject matter they're tackling. Because this could be a really depressing oh, film. Oh, sure. On paper, it's probably a really depressing film. I mean, it has. Uh, I think it has a cheeky sense of humor. 
you know, in the beginning, it's the 80s pop music because they're dealing with stuff in the 80s and the Cold War. But I think the pop kind of stuff goes throughout, even the scenes that are supposed to be a little more, um, you know, that that scene when he's in Africa talking about the AIDS scare or whatever and yeah. with the two women. Right. I mean, it's a Portishead song, you know, yeah. it's all contemporary music. And then there's little gimmicks um, when the rounds are flying out of the chamber. It's making the cash drawer sounds yeah. in the beginning. But when the plane almost hits the baby, I mean, just little spots in it where it's cheeky humor. That's yeah. probably how you would describe sure, that, right? Absolutely. And that just lightens the mood. When you're talking about something really heavy like this, that's a great way to make it more accessible and still keep people directly involved with what's happening. So, yeah, the film kind of has this it's it's got a really original kind of sense of humor about what's going on. And then there's some weird aspects that get thrown in that are more, you know, Hollywood movie checklist. Right. There's a romance story which has almost zero bearing on the film. <laughs> right. Um there's a uh there's the whole um rival gunrunner yeah, yeah. thing which goes on and I guess it has some bearing but just barely. Yeah. Because I mean, okay, so they're saying, you know, the marriage gets him out of running guns yeah. for what? four minutes yeah right um very briefly and you don't even really know what business he's in when exactly. he gets outside of the guns but it's it still seems like it's a little shady he says he's gone legitimate right. but i don't know how legitimate right. he's really gone which also brings up the ethan hawks character yeah. valentine yeah who plays this you know hot shot by the books cop who's gonna right. bring down this guy at whatever cost and he again he he shows up throughout the film and he kind of foils plans but ends up foiling himself to serve for one scene where Nicholas Cage, where Nicholas Cage gets to go, yeah, well, the American government runs guns too. Yeah, that's the whole purpose of his character to show that it's bigger than the law, right? Which goes without saying. You know what he reminds me of? Remember when we saw Insomnia, the character that Al Pacino played? Yeah, he's the exact opposite of that character. Mm -hmm. The character Al Pacino portrayed in Insomnia was an ends justify the means kind of guy. He would. Uh, I don't want to give away a bunch of plot stuff yeah. about that because we're not talking about that, but. He wanted to catch people at whatever cost, and he wasn't concerned with the law. And you see that from the beginning of the film, and that carries through the entire thing. Just the opposite here. Jack's a guy who obeys the law, no matter if he agrees with it or not, no matter how temporary it is. You yeah. know, at one point they're talking about, oh, that's a loophole. That'll be closed any minute now. Yeah. And Yuri says, well, it's not closed, and I know that you want to obey the law. Mm -hmm. And that's a really great tactic for him because we see throughout the rest of the movie, he's just paying off everyone who isn't this kind of by-the-book uh, yeah, character right. that Jack is. Usually when you have a movie like this, and something I think is pretty unique for this film, the character that does things by the book that can't be paid off, really, you know, to use your word, of the foil. I mean, he is the foil of the film. He is the one character that can take down your, usually your protagonist because he can't be paid off. The protagonist goes around paying off, uh, you know, everybody who gets in his way, but here's somebody who cannot be paid off. However, Yuri goes out of his way to make things look legitimate by the end of the film, almost just to get around Jack. Yeah. I mean, as if Jack is the, representing the only organization that is after him. Everybody else he continues paying off, but he has this whole segment of his business, all of this stuff with passports and, you know, all of these, um, this whole false identity the, the, where he's talking about you multiple know, identities. Yeah. And he's like having two identities isn't so bad. Three or four is what gets you into trouble. Right. And really the only reason that he does that, I mean, it might help with the bribes, but it's just so Jack can't catch him. And really, throughout the movie, Jack never catches him. Right. I mean, he thinks he's got him once. He catches but... him on a on a very odd technicality. Right. Which I'm not 100% sure... Works? Yeah. He gets caught when he's coming back from Sierra Leone. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, his brother's been shot right. by uh, apparently one of his own bullets. Right. Okay, can we pause here? What is his brother doing there? His brother is a device. Yeah, it's a total plot device. His brother... He... He goes to his brother and he says, hey, I need to bring you in for a job, knowing that his brother is a uh, loose cannon. And he tells his brother, anyway, you know, I, I don't care that you're on drugs and that you're always ruining the family parties. Uh, you're coming with me on this job. It'll be good for you for really no reason. And of course, as everyone knows, will happen. His brother completely fucks up. Well, I guess only 50% yeah. fucks up uh, the deal there. But yeah, that's eventually how he gets caught because there's that bullet they find from one of his own guns that's there. I guess they can link the guns to him because how? he 
it's his i i don't know the, i guess the the one thing that they kind of do is when he decides not to cut the thing out of the newspaper and they've apparently followed his wife to his biz, his i guess his office right yeah, yeah. it's his office and maybe they're in the shipping I guess, container i guess there's cuz he says he's got paperwork right but apparently the paperwork is all forged to be legitimate but maybe there's some illegitimate legitimacies or something like that you would make a better cop than i would point is there's a knock at the door and somebody who far outranks him tells him that he's done a great job, but he has to let Yuri go. In just the way Yuri said would happen. And so there's a couple of great things about this scene. The first great thing about this scene is that Yuri gives him this five-minute monologue about how he is a necessary evil. And then Jack gives him this one line and walks out of the room, which is essentially... Your uh, life sucks, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh yeah, sucks to be you. Yeah. And then, then he leaves. And I love how beautiful and simple that is because, I mean, that's where I come down on a lot of what we're going to be talking about with both of our protagonists through the movie because they represent uh, not necessarily cynical viewpoints, but, you know, he talks about being a necessary evil. You don't have to listen to a lot of episodes of our show to know that I don't agree with the idea, philosophically, really, the idea of necessary evil Mm -hmm. because it's a, you know, it's a pragmatic argument. And so what does Yuri give him? A bunch of pragmatic arguments. He says these things... Uh, you know, if I don't do it, someone else will. And you think there aren't other people doing this too, you know, as if that justifies what he's saying. And those are all pragmatic arguments. They are speaking completely. Uh, they're having different debates here. Yuri wants to have a debate about pragmatism. And Ethan Hawke's character is someone who does it by the books. He believes in good and evil. And every decision you make is either good or evil. And so a necessary evil to him is just evil. So he says the only thing that makes sense in that scenario, he's not going to combat one-on-one, debate him about Mm. these pragmatic arguments, because in that sense, Yuri is probably right. You know, the government does engage in a lot of this, and he is a necessary component if the government wants to do that. So Jack instead looks at his life and says, wow, yeah, your life pretty much sucks, though, doesn't it? All right, see ya. I think that's one of the only times the movie really gets heavy. Yeah. Um, But, I mean, him delivering that line doesn't, you know... Oh, by the time he says that and walks out of the room, that whole air of, of heaviness has kind of dissipated. Most of the times the movie gets heavy, it mocks itself. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed this right from the beginning. You know, you made a joke about it or whatever, but the uh, the sign, the, the movie kind of makes the joke for itself. The sign that's in the kitchen, beware of dog. And Jared Leto's character goes mm-hmm. on and on about how it's the dog inside himself. So the movie accomplishes actually talking about how Jared Leto is fighting and right. his character is fighting an interpersonal conflict, but it also makes fun of the way uh, he's not the artist in the family. Right. He's using a really dumb metaphor. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a sign about a dog that sits in his kitchen. So what do you think about this this whole idea of Yuri's character, this rationalization that he has that if he doesn't do it, someone else will? I mean, obviously you know how I feel about that, but is that justification to do something? Is he just taking a job that someone else would take if, you know, if he doesn't do it? It depends on how you look at it. If you look at it as an individual, if you look at it as just Yuri, it honestly, in the in a global sense, if you're saying, should Yuri do this or not do this, it mm-hmm. does not matter. However, if you're looking at it as every gun runner has this decision posed, and if every gun runner makes the decision to not do it, there would be no gun runners. Right, right. But... I think in his mind, he knows, you know, he's living in a practical world where he knows that if he quits, somebody's just going to be up there right away. So there's also a lot of other things that come to play that kind of raise the same question. Again, when they're in Sierra Leone and they're at the point where V, his brother, wants to take off Mm -hmm. and Yuri says, no, we just need to do this and then we'll leave. And there's an argument about how they're going to kill this settlement of villagers And if they don't do the deal, they're just going to kill them and then the settlement of villagers. So you kind of have to go, well, where do your allegiances lie? Do you want to die, you know, for your beliefs or should you at least, you know, save yourself? Yeah, Yeah, right. When when you know the outcome will be the same regardless of your own standing. It's a really great situation from a writing standpoint because those worldviews sort of collide. You know, uh, the black and white view of good versus evil and should you do right things or wrong things that very pure moralistic viewpoint collides head on with the pragmatic viewpoint hey look the village is right over there this is going to happen right now but of course yuri's character comes right back with a pragmatic viewpoint again you know his brother is hoping that will appeal to his human side 
that he will look at the faces of these children over here and say, you know what, you're right, they'll be slaughtered. But instead, he retorts with another pragmatic argument, the one you bring up. If we don't sell them these guns, then they're just going to kill us and take the guns anyways. That's not even something his brother is concerned with. So how his brother responds is to go and pick up a grenade and, you know, talk about pragmatism. His brother says, well, I'm going to find a pragmatic solution to this uh, moralistic conflict here. I guess when I view that as a thought experiment, I look at that situation and say, if each person who said, I am a necessary evil, stopped what they were doing, then all of the necessary evil would be gone. And I realize that in practice, that's not going to happen. But I would rather personally not contribute as a, uh, I would not want to allow myself to be one of the people who is creating necessary evil. If everybody just stopped being necessary evil, that entire idea would disappear. We wouldn't need characters like Yuri to help the shady side of the United States government who believes that they need to do a necessary evil as well. Uh, But again, that's because I don't think pragmatically like that. So one other thing the film does that's really good with the use of guns is the film could, and it starts to, use Europe. Mm -hmm. Because that's the go-to. Because there's no wars in America. Right. Fortunately for us, we never have any wars in our country. They don't come here, yeah. And we're fucking fine and great. So you have to go... The obvious choice is if you want it to seem like America, just go to Europe. Because they're all whiteies. (laughs) Sure. And they've all got guns there, too. But the thing is, he picks up guns in Europe and then goes to Africa, which is where war is really going on, where guns are really getting their use. Yeah. And he ends up becoming friends with the president of Liberia, Andre, and his son, Andre Jr., gets him the gun of Rambo. Never gets the Rambo gun, does he? He does. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. The thing I really like is that Africa almost becomes a player in the game. Yeah. Because the environment is so dangerous and so intense that many times just... The fact that they're in Africa allows certain things to happen, like when they land the plane. Yeah, I like that scene of landing the plane on the road, which is also something they do in 24, land a plane on a highway. I think that's the fifth season. Anytime someone's landing a plane on a highway, for some reason, that's really exciting to me. I have no idea why. But uh, even better is the time lapse of everyone stealing the plane, um, of all of the kids showing up. Well, first, there's the great scene where the kids get all the guns, and then as uh, Yuri's sitting out there, they show time going by rather quickly and all of uh, everybody just swarming in and taking pieces of the plane, which is really sad to me. Maybe it's, again, my, my, uh, my business side kicking in. But here you have uh, this million dollar plane that someone could take or they're going to take all the metal scraps. I mean, they're worth basically nothing compared. But they have, what use do they have for a plane? So they steal the plane. It's just the way they do that time lapse scene is just fantastic. That's a really strange note to go out on, but I think we uh, we have another movie to do, don't we? Yeah, we we do. We got to cover Thank You for Smoking. If I can set up some context here, neither one of us smoke, um, but we're both, you know, pro-smoking, I guess. We're not (laughs) pro-smoking. How do you you describe that? Politically pro-smoking, right? Yeah. Pro-smokers' rights? Is that okay? Yeah. I'm I'm never going to say I'm pro-smoking. No, no, right. Although the the more we... um, shrink smokers rights in this country the more i feel like i should befriend smokers because i see them as a (laughs) they're freedom fighters right Mm -hmm. that's what it is yeah right freedom fighters uh something i don't think about a whole lot in the smoking debate is well they start with this tex williams song Mm -hmm. uh smoke 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 which is criticizing not smoking for its you know its health well it's before health or before the health risks were even known even says early in the song you know i don't believe it has any adverse health i believe that's an actual quote i Mm -hmm. don't believe it has any adverse effects i could be wrong on the lyrics something like that yeah i could obviously never write lyrics but it's criticizing people who have to stop everything that's going on every 20 minutes to go have a fucking smoke. And that's the thing I don't like about smoking. Yeah, for sure. The smell, whatever, that sucks. And the health stuff, that sucks. And I don't know about secondhand smoke. I don't know anything about that. But what I do know is I'm really bummed out when I'm with a bunch of smokers and we're doing something and then they all disappear because they take everybody with them, right? It's just when you hang out in a group, uh, let's say there's a um, pick in your head, seven of your friends arbitrarily, mm-hmm. and one goes out to smoke, how many of your friends disappear? Five. Yeah, they're all gone. It's pretty much you and if maybe one there, other person. <laughs> yeah, right. Four. It's the two of us that just <laughs> hang out while everybody else smokes, and they're gone for as long as uh, the periods in which they come back before they leave again. Fucking smokers always disappearing on us. So there's a lot of stuff I love about Thank You for Smoking. Um, small elements that just come back. The characters are all fantastic. 
Um, the mod squad is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Anytime the mod squad is sitting down, the whole concept of the mod squad is great. The people in the mod squad are great. That sort of competitive uh, elements to how many, you know, well, how many really deaths. It's a really dark and, competition. Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's fantastic. That's why I like it. I it's really, dark comedy. I mean, it That's even like gets it. to the point where, you know, Nick is all pissed off because he got kidnapped and he's he's right. giving them what for because they would never get kidnapped. They don't do nearly enough social right. damage to ever be kidnapped and their hearts are broken yep. hearing this information. And they don't ever betray the darkness of that scene. Mm-hmm. It is treated completely seriously the entire time, uh, which is one of the things I love about the movie that it's serious but has uh, you know quite cynical characters. The movie knows where it's making the jokes and some of the jokes are a little bit cynical, too, and the characters are very cynical about what they do and their viewpoints. But the movie approaches it with this very straight-faced way. When you look at that scene with the, with the mod squad, never once do they joke about the fact that they're all upset that he got kidnapped. They never realize, I don't even want to call it irony, but this guy just got kidnapped, mm-hmm. right? They need to stop at some point. Normal human beings would stop and go, okay, we're making fun of a kidnapping right now let's remember what we're talking about but they never do that Mm -hmm. they're really heartbroken as you say they are really torn apart about this and that's part of the tone of the film that i really like oh yeah jk simmons is fantastic in this he is always a great boss um i've seen him as a boss in maybe five or six different movies and he is just always fantastic he's spot on with that william h macy is good um william h macy his his character is playing the senator and the whole point of his character is this uh, this poison label on the. You ever seen other countries do do this? Oh yeah, the poison label on mm-hmm. the. You ever seen some of these? Yeah. So I think I might have talked about this before, so I won't ramble on about it. But when I was in Canada, they just started that probably a year or two before then, and it was a big joke to them. It didn't stop any of them from smoking. It actually encouraged them because I think there were six different labels. In Canada, I don't even know if they have cigarette companies. I think the government just run. I know they run all the alcohol stores. They might just run all the the uh, tobacco companies. I don't know how it works up there. But there were six uh, labels from this new Canadian law that you know put, and it wasn't even skull and crossbones. It was you know dead fetuses and birth defect. I mean, but pretty fucked up stuff that they put sure. right on the right. right on the package, and smokers would collect them. And it was just really humorous. But that doesn't actually stop people from smoking. This whole idea that people, they don't know that smoking is going to kill them. Everyone knows that at this point. And it's only a joke to them when an oppressive agency like the government tries to say, we're going to push it in your face every time you buy a, a cigarette pack. People feel this natural urge to lash out against that. They see the fucking label in stores and go, you know what? Fuck you. I'm going to buy two packs because of that. I believe in psychology that's called the boomerang effect when you're speaking specifically about someone lashing out in order to feel like they're preserving their own rights. While we're hitting on all the characters, we need to revisit child actors because we yeah. haven't talked about this in a while. I think last time we really talked about it was shorts, and it sounds like we were getting over child actors. Mm-hmm. And then the kid from Bad Santa showed up again. What happened there? Uh, so it's it's this kid. I've it's seen not him. actually the kid right. from Bad Santa. We no, should say. I've seen him in a bunch of films. Yeah. He's in. I think he's in X three. Well, there's, there's only he's five in, child. Yeah, actors. there's five or six child actors, and maybe one or two of them are talented. Right. Props to Hit Girl from Kick Ass. Okay. Um, but this kid. He just sucks the life out of every line he's given. Out of given. the film. He's it's so, terrible. It's so sad because he's supposed to be such a strong character. and the He's one, important is the thing. The one thing that, that I do not believe about this child is that he will ever grow up and right. be Nick Naylor. I mean, I imagine Nick Naylor at his age was conning kids out of their chocolate milk. Yep. And this kid is going, why is America the greatest government <laughs> right. ever? unfamiliar with how to do a bullshit essay right and i mean he's not very old but you learn quick especially if you're going to be what he's being i guess primed to become yeah but he keeps getting these lines that are keystone lines you know a lot of them are bringing back stuff from earlier in the sure. film the one that always grinds in my brain is when he gets in the car and nick naylor goes how did, what did you say to convince her and he says it was an argument, not a negotiation. Yeah. But he, the line is just delivered absolutely cartoonishly. Yeah. And it's just, it's it takes what could be such a great, like, look, I'm becoming you, and goes, look, I'm a little kid. Yeah, it's supposed to be poetic and cyclical and uh, almost self-referential. It's none of those things. It just doesn't function at it all. Seem, he's just so cartoony. 
And he just cartoony can't, is what it is. He You're can't right. pull off these lines, and unfortunately, especially as we've already mentioned, the acting in this film, the acting and the writing together is what makes it. These actors are completely invested in the world. They're completely invested in who they are. Rob Lowe's character, yeah. for example, yeah. Adam Brody, who plays the um, his intern over yeah. at the production studio. Those characters are completely otherworldly, but they're not aware of it. Right. And other people may be aware of it, but they're nervous sure to say to call them out nick is right. uncomfortable around both of them yeah and but he won't call them out the closest he gets is asking rob lowe's character when he sleeps yeah at which point he responds sundays and hangs up the phone as if you know that didn't phase me at all but yeah. this kid i mean especially seeing him pitted in the scene against sam elliott the marlboro man yep. that is the strongest role in the film yeah that man he just has to look at you and yep. you believe everything that his character is. Yeah. The little kid's in the other room drinking tea. Yep. Like, oh, what's going on? Looks through the window. <laughs> well, the problem is all the other characters are severely layered just in their performances. Maybe not in uh, the way the characters are built from uh, from a writing standpoint. You know, maybe that's not too layered. But the way that the characters, we've already talked about it being cynical, but not ironic. At the same time, not realizing the otherworldliness of each other, of specifically of themselves, even if they do each other. The kid has none of this. Mm -hmm. He's not even at layer number one. I mean, you could play this in a couple ways. Here's why I mentioned Bad Santa. Bad Santa was something where, and it's the same performance. I mean, close your eyes and just listen to this kid deliver the lines. But Bad Santa was, uh, you know, that kid's acting job, he was probably natural for the part. I doubt he was portraying something that was very much unlike how he is in real life. He was a young kid and probably shy and awkward and whatever. Uh, but he delivers what's specifically right for the movie. So you could do that. And sometimes, most times, I think, when we like a child actor, it's because they just naturally act like whoever they're supposed to be in the movie. So you could go a direction where this kid is just reciting things verbatim that his dad says without realizing the context in which he's saying them. And that's one way to go. He just regurgitates what his dad says, and it, it says something about childlike innocence and youth and blah, blah, blah. But you could go another direction where he understands what his dad is saying and he delivers these performances as if he is going to grow into his dad. The film would have you believe it's option number two. It might default back on option number one, but the script says that it is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. The script says it's option number two. And what you end up getting is neither of the options. You don't get someone who's just verbatim saying what his dad's saying because that doesn't seem natural. You get someone who looks like they're just reading lines. It doesn't function on either one of those levels. I, it's just terrible. It totally takes you out of the film. There's the character of the Marlboro Man as well, uh, who you mentioned. Just really quick, you're presented with this briefcase of money. What do you do in that? You want to talk about thought experiments. This is a day for that yeah. stuff. What do you do in that situation? I was thinking about it. I was trying to come up with a way around it. Sam Elliott plays the Marlboro Man. Mm -hmm. And as we said, he's great. But he gets presented with not a bribe, but a gift yeah. of, I would say, a, let's say hypothetically a million dollars. It's one million dollars. One million dollars, taxes paid. So to set this scene up, in case you haven't seen the movie, because our audience just doesn't watch movies, apparently. If he takes this money, there's an implied bribe there. Nick essentially says to him, he gives him his, you know, sweet PR lingo and, sure. uh, and this guy totally buys it. You know, Nick has set up for him. If you take the money and call the press and whatever, then you're going to have to donate it to charity. You're not going to get to keep it. But if you take the money as a bribe, then you get to keep every penny of it as long as no one finds out about it. And he, uh, he appeals to the anger that this character has towards the tobacco companies and eventually gets him to keep the money. So it's a hard position. You either, you're going to accept the money either way. He's going to leave it on the doorstep. That doesn't matter. You either accept the money and use it uh, as a tool to complain to the media, but then you don't get any money. You get, you know, social justice, but you don't get any money or you keep the money and you don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. What do you do in that situation? You know, I it depends on how mad you are, I guess. It depends yeah. on where you really want to stick it. I guess it might depend on how poorly you're doing financially. I mean, I would imagine that this guy's got some hell hell of a hospital bill. Yeah. See, I don't even know if it's how mad you are because I go, well, what if I was super mad? And then I still don't know what option I would choose because on one hand, you know, this isn't even an ethical thing, which is the ethical option. 
because if you keep the money and you accept it as, you know, you can keep calling it a bribe, but I would think of it in my mind Reparations. as- Yeah, that's kind of what it is. It's uh, getting so money it's back. It's like a settlement, like a lawsuit yeah, settlement? Sure, sure. Out it's of like a settlement. And so I either use the money for a political awareness campaign to let people know about the dangers of smoking, or I, I use it for myself. I feel like either way, there isn't an ethical line there, so I don't really know what option I would choose. Neither do I. Another one the movie throws at you that I'm not sure how I feel about is uh, this thing with Heather. So Heather is the reporter, and she is um, basically what she does is sleep with him for a long time throughout the film and get all his secrets and then publish them. And of course, that's a mean, evil, awful thing. But she throws it back in his face as, well, I'm just doing my job. You know, the same things that he says. Right. He has to pay his mortgage, she says, and he's just doing what he's good at. So she says right back to him, I'm just doing what I'm good at. I got a mortgage to pay too, as if to not only justify her actions, but maybe teach him a lesson. Yeah. Do you think these characters are doing the same thing? No. Well, so apparently what Nick Naylor's good at doing is talking and convincing people. Apparently what she's good at doing is fucking guys and talking to them. Right. And then she says, so I'm a reporter. Right. It Really, she's a call girl. So you think his job is more it. pure, not because she's, you know using her body, but because the very job he does is to talk to people. Right. And that accomplishes the thing. He exactly. Is, that's, he gets to his end objective by doing his job where she gets to her end objective. By whatever means necessary. Right. Sure. Either way, I think that tells you more about Nick's character. The movie uses it as uh, an opportunity to say, well, maybe you're siding with Nick a little too much. Here's this thing this person has just done should make you feel betrayed as the audience. That clearly wasn't a cool thing for her to do. And maybe that informs you a little bit more about Nick. Maybe it makes you second guess what he's been, because by the time you spend this much time with him, you almost start to agree with a lot of what he's saying. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's the power of the film. It's the power of argument, I guess. You know, this movie's a lot less about business and more about debate. Not the debate of smoking, but debate in general. Uh, it's a movie that's about debate and PR, about talking, as he says. Um, his arguments themselves, you know, I already touched on that. They're pretty cynical arguments. It's how can you spin things in order to give people, it's like that Frank Luntz thing, you yeah. know, it's like the polling stuff. How do you take numbers and spin them in a way to represent your viewpoint? Something I don't agree with, but that doesn't make me disagree with the film because the film is almost about uncovering that stuff, letting people know that that stuff exists. And that's where I think the the film has almost an advocacy position, an awareness Mm -hmm. position where it's trying to say, hey, you guys should know that this is how stuff is spun. Not necessarily directly with the tobacco companies, although they talk a lot about the deaths and how many per day and, and all that stuff. How cold, simple, factual numbers are manipulated to make a case for different sides, whatever they be. So I think there's one more scene that we definitely have to talk about. You know, this discussion would not be complete without uh, specifically at least referencing this scene for something. And it it's not the congressional hearing, because I know you think that when you have a congressional hearing with crazy backlighting and a bunch of weird art stuff, that automatically I have to come on the show and say something about that. And I guess I just did. Mm-hmm. But that's not even what I want to talk about. Although, what the hell is going on there with the J.J. Abrams lens flare and the Okay, you're giving me a look. All right, that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the whatever device, something we have been referencing for, what, two and a half years or something. Pretty much. And never really, I mean, that whole scene really needs to be unpacked because it's really heavy. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. Yeah, there's this scene where he get where they're talking about product placement, I guess, but that's not really what's going on. That's sort of why they start talking about it. They're talking about product placement. They're talking about this scene where Mm -hmm. Brad Pitt and Catherine Zeta-Jones, who was an actor a while ago, they're having sex in space and they're all smoking. But in the film, it's in space and Nick Naylor says, cigarettes in space, wouldn't they explode in an all-oxygen environment? To which Rob Lowe's character responds, well, you know, one line of dialogue, easy fix. Thank God we invented the whatever device. Ah, uh, the great deus ex machina, something we complain about all the yeah. time. Um, I don't remember when that first came up on the show. It's something we've referred to as the Superman device because it seems like Anytime Superman's in in a jam, you just give him whatever power he needs. He has the unjamming power, uh-huh. and suddenly, up oh, there you go. 
but that is the deus ex machina and it's something you should watch out for and it's even you know we've rallied against montages but if there's anything that upsets me in a movie it's when they clearly just create a device to get around something i don't know if if the whatever device is specifically a deus ex machina because it's used to achieve the ends of product placement, yeah. not to achieve plot ends. Right. But I'm going to go ahead and use it anyways, because I think that's Well, fine. I think the whatever device is used innocently enough. Plus, it's a sci-fi film, and the whatever device, in the context of Thank You for Smoking, where it's some machine that prevents cigarettes from blowing up in an right. all-oxygen environment, that's fine. I would buy that whatever, yeah, because be that's that. not important to the film. But again, the whatever device extends to be beyond that. It extends to be, you know, lights in places where you wouldn't expect them and such. You know, something else that scene does, and when I when I say, you know, we need to unpack that, I mean, there's a lot going on in there. They talk about that, but they also talk about the role, and they only touch on it briefly, but it's a, but I think it's something really heavy. They're talking about the role of content creators as moral agents. You know, when he first walks in there and they sit down, he says, well, who am I to, you know, who am I to hand down my viewpoints um, to the audience, which is something we've been talking about yeah. with this very film. The film says it's not up to us to say whether or not smoking is good or bad. You know, maybe a little bit they talk about that stuff, but you have to talk about it in the story. Mm-hmm. It would be weird if these characters didn't actually talk about that stuff on screen. But this guy is presenting a viewpoint that it seems like the creators of this film has have taken rather than having... um Rather than the film endorsing a side of the argument, it believes that its moral position as the the producers of the film, as the creators of the film, is just to present the argument and let the audience kind of pick apart that argument themselves. I've always kind of made stuff with the idea of, well, here I have an argument in mind and maybe I can present my side of the argument to people. But it's interesting to think that the the moral position on this is not to do that to your audience. Right. And that is definitely something we'll be watching out more for as we uh, now that now that someone has actually said that aloud, uh-huh. and I've gone, oh, that that is an interesting way to look at that. Um, maybe I'll notice it pop up everywhere in all the films we do. So we have some more stuff coming up next week. Yeah, you know, I wish we had more stuff like this. This double think, feature I pairing think next was week just will be so pretty close. Yeah, yeah, you think so? Yeah. All right, so I haven't seen one of the ones from next week. Right. You, uh, you're you bringing this one to me fresh. Yeah. Um, so we'll see if these things kind of go. I mean, just the, the feel of this, how they're talking about, you know, the devil's advocacy thing. I just thought these two films were, I could watch two more films just like it right uh-huh. now. We have an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You know what? If you know two more movies like Thank You for Smoking and Lord of War, you should email me and let me know. Um, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. We also have a website that's doublefeatureshow.com and uh, sign up on our Facebook thing because we got a lot of yeah. people on there talking and that's Sweet. cool. So what are we doing next time? Next time we're going to do Cold Souls and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. What, is, what are those? I know Eternal Sunshine, right? That's the Michelle Gondry thing. Yeah. It's the Jim Carrey plays a serious role. Uh-huh. But I think there's actually a lot of really good stuff in Eternal Sunshine. Haven't seen it in a while. I think that's going to be another Fight Club kind of situation yeah. where I come back to it and go, oh, that was really obnoxious. But there are these other things uh-huh. that are kind of cool. And what's the other thing? I Cold even... Souls, it's a movie. It came out in uh, 2009. It stars Paul Giamatti as himself. So he gets his soul removed. It'll be a great time. All right. I hope it will. Awesome. Watch more fucking film. Bye.